Will everyone please remain standing for the singing of the national anthem. Our national anthem will be sung by Ms. Gabby Villasenor, a student at Mountain View High School in the 10th grade with a grade point average of 3.9. Thank you. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the rockets rang louder the bombs bursting in air flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabby. And now, will everybody please be seated? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the College of Education and Integrative Studies 2001 Commencement Ceremony. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students of the college, I offer congratulations to our graduates and a very special welcome to the families and friends who join us here today. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce the distinguished members of the platform party. I ask that each of them stand as I read their names, but please hold your applause until they have all been introduced. Dr. Bob Suzuki, President of the California State Polytechnic University, Pomona. Mr. Dave Master, Hugh O. Labounty, Endowed Professor of Interdiscipl Interdisciplinary Applied Knowledge. Dr. Jane Allenberger, Vice President, Academic Affairs. Ms. Patricia Ferris, Vice President, Administrative Affairs. Dr. Esteban Soriano, Vice President, University Advancement. Dr. Michael Berman, Vice President for Instructional and Information Technology. Dr. Lorraine Turk, Acting Vice President for Student Affairs. Dr. Joe Block, Academic Senator, Department of Liberal Studies. Dr. Teresita Aguilar, Associate Dean. Dr. Stephen Bryant, Chair, Liberal Studies. Dr. Gilbert Cadena, Chair, Ethnic and Women's Studies. Dr. Dorothy McNiven, Chair, Department of Education. Ms. Mary Ann Cordes, Outstanding Student, Senior Class Representative, and recipient of the McPhee Award. Dr. Aubrey Fine, Professor, College of Education and Integrative Studies. Ms. Dolores Villasenor, Distinguished Alumnus and Principal of Pueblo Elementary Complex. I would also like to introduce Christine Master, our speaker's wife, who is in the audience. Christine, will you please stand? And now, let us welcome all of you. Thank you very much. 
I would now like to call on President Suzuki for his welcoming remarks. President Suzuki. Thank you, Richard. It's a pleasure for me to join Dean Navarro in welcoming all of you, our graduates and your parents, families, and friends on this happy occasion. My sincere congratulations to our graduates, as well as those who supported you in reaching this most significant milestone in your lives. Let me also wish all of you the very best as you leave this university. You have received a rigorous education here from our outstanding faculty who are deeply committed to excellence in teaching and learning, the primary goal of Cal Poly Pomona. We also have a great academic support staff who have assisted you in countless ways to have a successful academic and social experience here. As a result, I'm confident you'll find yourself very well prepared, whether you pursue a career in the workplace or go on to professional or graduate school. If you don't realize it already, you should also know that Cal Poly Pomona enjoys an excellent reputation, not only in our immediate region, but increasingly throughout the state and the nation. In this year's US News and World Report college rankings, Cal Poly Pomona tied for third place in the category of top Western U regional public universities. The university is also ranked among the top 20 universities nationally in awarding baccalaureate degrees to minority students. Our growing reputation is due to the extraordinary achievements of our students, faculty, and alumni. Let me give you just a few examples. Cal Poly Pomona is the only campus in the California State University system to have a faculty member win the coveted Wong Family Excellence Award each year since its inception. They include Dr. Vernon Staubel, a leader in international business and marketing, Dr. Stephen Wickler, recognized in equine research and animal and veterinary science, and Dr. Aubrey Fine, a respected educator and specialist in service learning, developmental disabilities, and recreational therapy, who will be introduced uh, shortly. California State University trustee Stanley Wong funds this prestigious $20,000 award. These faculty are a reflection of the excellence of our faculty at Cal Poly Pomona. For this fourth straight year, the Cal Poly Pomona Model United Nations team, coached by history professor John Moore, won major honors at the National Model United Nations Conference an intense and highly competitive simulation of the actual United Nations. The team earned two of the most coveted marks of distinction at this year's conference, competing against 2,500 students from 220 universities around the country. In March of this year, our women's basketball team, through stupendous and courageous efforts, won the NCAA Division II National Championship in Rochester, Minnesota. It was the fourth national championship for our women's basketball team, but no doubt one of the most memorable. Our student athletes are not only highly talented athletes, they are also excellent students, making our athletic program one of the best Division II programs in the country. Students from the two Cal Polys, Pomona and San Luis Obispo, won the Founders Trophy for its float entry in the 2001 Tournament of Roses Parade in Pasadena on New Year's Day. Over the past 52 years, our student design and built floats have won over three dozen awards and have pioneered a number of innovations such as animation, which are now commonly used in many other floats. About five years ago, our College of Engineering was ranked the fourth best engineering program in the nation in a survey taken by Rockwell International. The ranking was based on how well the graduates from the various engineering programs are performing on the job. In the same survey, Cal Poly Pomona's mechanical engineering program was ranked number one in the nation. Around the same time, two teams of students from our computer information systems department entered a national competition in Texas against about 60 other institutions with some of the best CIS programs in the country and finished first and third in this competition. 
Last year, our student newspaper, the Poly Post, won 19 awards, including four first place awards in the 51st California Intercollegiate Press Association Conference. Our alumni have also been highly successful. One of our graduates in finance, real estate, and law, Brian Hofstad, went on to the UCLA Law School and graduated first in his class. He later clerked for Associate Justice of the US Supreme Court, Sandra Day O'Connor. Another alumnus, Patrick Lair, is superintendent of one of the largest school districts in the area, the Pomona Unified School District, which serves 33,000 students at 35 school sites and 4,000 employees. This is only a very abbreviated list of the achievements of our students, faculty, and alumni. I could go on and on, but I think it gives you an idea of why Cal Poly Pomona enjoys such a great reputation. However, because Cal Poly Pomona, as well as other CSU campuses, are among the least expensive institutions of higher education to attend, people often mistakenly believe we do not offer the highest quality education. The truth is that Cal Poly Pomona offers an education that is equal to or better than the quality of education offered by institutions costing several times more. It is, in fact, one of the best bargains and best values in higher education. And over the next five to 10 years, Cal Poly Pomona will become an even better institution. As you may have noticed, we have a lot of construction going on on campus. In the next five years, we will have completed a total of over $500 million in new construction over a 10-year period. The new buildings that are going up will have a dramatic impact in changing the physical face of this campus and provide state-of-the-art facilities for our students. We are also becoming increasingly successful in attracting private and federal support for the university, and our endowment for the university has quadrupled in the last five years. The Council of Aid to Education ranks Cal Poly Pomona sixth in the nation for corporate support and 11th in the nation for overall fundraising among all public universities with master's degree programs. As a large number of our faculty retire in the next 10 to 12 years, we will re be replacing them with around 300 new faculty. We have already been successful in attracting many outstanding new faculty who are bringing fresh knowledge, ideas, and vitality to the university, and together with our more experienced faculty, are helping the university attain new heights of excellence. I believe these and other developments will enable Cal Poly Pomona to become one of the most distinguished teaching universities in the country. With such a strong history of achievements by our students, faculty, and alumni, I am confident that all of you who are graduating today are well prepared for your future careers and will enjoy great success in the years ahead. I want to commend especially those of you who are entering the teaching profession. I do not know of a nobler and more important profession in our society. You, you have the potential to have a huge impact on the lives of the children you teach and can thereby play a significant role in working toward the betterment of our society. While the challenges facing you are formidable through your dedication to children, you will be helping build a better future for our society. I am sure you recognize the significant support you have received from many of our many outstanding faculty and staff. They, along with your families, have helped you succeed here. As alumni, we hope you will come back to Cal Poly Pomona to act as mentors to our students, serve on advisory groups, speak to student organizations, and give back to the university in many other ways in return for the support you have received while you were students here, and help future generations of our students who follow in your footsteps to succeed. We have ble been blessed with your presence at this university, and we hope you will return home to this campus many times in the future. Good luck and my best wishes to all of you as you pursue your hopes and dreams in the years ahead. Thank you very much and congratulations once again. Thank you very much, President Suzuki.
Now I would like to introduce the senior class representative from the College of Education and Integrative Studies, Mary Ann Cordes, who will present the senior class gift to President Suzuki. President Suzuki, Dean Navarro, members of the stage party, distinguished guests, and fellow members of the class of 2001. It is a tradition at Cal Poly Pomona for the members of the graduating class to leave a gift of lasting value to the campus and to make our campus a better place for future students. This year, it is my pleasure to continue that tradition. President Suzuki, I would like to present to you on behalf of the class of 2001, our gift, the installation of new benches manufactured from sustainable materials to be placed on the west side of the CLA building to provide a safe, convenient, and more attractive place for students to gather. These benches, not done yet, <laughs> these benches will be a part of a new landscaping initiative that will dramatically enhance this area of the campus and we are proud to be a part of the project. Thank you very much, Marianne. Uh, this is a great gift, which I'm sure future generations of our students will appreciate very much. Thank you, class of 2001. The outstanding student from the Liberal Studies Department for the year 2001 is the same, Marianne Cordes, with a grade point average of 3.9. Congratulations, Marianne. And now I would like to call President Suzuki to the podium to make a very special presentation. Come on up, Marianne. At this time, I'm very pleased to have the privilege of presenting the first Julian A. McPhee Honor Award for Student Excellence. Julian McPhee was the founding president of both Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and Cal Poly Pomona. He provided more than 35 years of dedicated service to the citizens of California. Due to his visionary leadership and astute negotiating skills, Californians can point with pride to two of the nation's finest universities founded on the educational principle of learn by doing. This special award was thoughtfully funded by an anonymous donor who was a colleague of Julian McPhee and honors a current graduating senior who exhibits excellence in his or her academic endeavors. The honoree from the College of Education and Integrative Studies as announced by Dean Navarro is Marianne Cordes. <clears throat> Marianne is a liberal studies major who is planning to become an elementary school teacher. Hurrah. Good luck to you as you enter this noble and challenging profession. Dean Nar Navarro, please join me in honoring Mary Ann, the recipient of the Julian A. McPhee Honor Award for Student Excellence. Congratulations, Mary Ann. This is certainly a proud moment for all of us. And now I'm pleased to to place along with those beautiful cords, this wonderful medallion symbolizing this award. President Suzuki, distinguished members of the platform party, honored guests, faculty, staff, family, and friends, graduates, you did it. You are the class of 2001. You are the future of the 21st century. 
As President Suzuki mentioned, this is the first year that the recommended credential candidates are being honored here with us today. And I would like to give them a very special welcome uh, to, to the College of Education and Integrative Studies 2001 commencement ceremony. Your presence here is a demonstration of your commitment to ensuring that every child has access to a qualified teacher in the classroom. You know, there's a saying that as I live in the present to the best of my ability, I create the future that I'm meant to have. You graduates are here today because of your hard work, your self-discipline, your sacrifices that you've made each and every day to reach this point. And as you turn this page in your own personal history, I ask you to reflect on the awesome responsibility that you assume with this degree and consider the future that you desire for yourself and for our society. We're joined here today with four individuals that I'd like to recognize because they are also accomplished professionals whose lives represent the values that we, the faculty, the students, the staff, and administration of the College of Education and Integrative Studies hold and values that we hope that we've imparted to each one of you. Our mace bearer, Dr. Sheila McCoy, was selected. <laughs> Dr. McCoy was selected as an outstanding advisor for the College of Education and Integrative Studies. She has been with the university for about 20 years, holding several leadership positions as chair of the Department of Liberal Studies, associate dean, and founding dean of what is now the College of Education and Integrative Studies. Dr. McCoy's life exemplifies the true values that we aspire to achieve and is best captured in the mission statement for the College of Education and Integrative Studies, especially the, their goals that we have for you, our graduates. And we state in our mission statement that our graduates are prepared for leadership to address the complex issues that confront our communities and in working toward a creative, a just, and a democratic society. Congratulations, Dr. McCoy. Thank you. We're also joined by Dr. Aubrey Fine, as President Suzuki mentioned, who is the recipient of the 2001, 2001 Wang Family Excellence Award. Dr. Fine. Dr. Fine is a longtime professor in the College of Education and Integrative Studies, as well as faculty coordinator of the University Center for Leadership and Service Learning. Dr. Fine is one of five recipients of the Wong Family Excellence Award among the 23 campuses of the CSU system. He has committed his, his professional life to service and bringing his students to the community to also learn the value of service. Ms. Dolores Villasenor, the 2001 Distinguished Alumnus and Principal of Pueblo Elementary Complex. <laughs> Ms. Villasenor graduated from Cal Poly Pomona in 1980 and received a Master's of Arts in Education with an emphasis in reading. Together with her husband, Dr. Julian Villasenor, also a SACE Distinguished Alumnus, she established the first bilingual education program in Pomona Schools. Her advocacy for children extended to her role as the founding principal of the Kellogg Polytechnic Elementary School, one of the very first professional development schools in the country established together with Cal Poly Pomona. Ms. V Ms. Villasenor, continues her life of service in trailblazing and innovative education as the principal of the Pueblo Elementary Complex at the Village at Indian Hill in Pomona Unified School District. Ms. Villasenor. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Mr. Dave Master. 
Mr. Master is our Hugh O. LeBounty Chair for Endowed Professor of Interdisciplinary and Applied Knowledge. Prior to coming to Cal Poly Pomona, Mr. Master was the Director for Artist Development at Warner Brothers Featured Animation for six years. And that followed a distinguished career as a high school teacher in the Roland Unified School District for 18 years, where he led his students to produce over 1,800 films and won over 900 awards. Among Dave's many honors are the IBM National Teacher of the Year for Technology and Learning, special recognitions for the Inter International Animated Film Society, and commendation by the Switzerland Center for, the Inno for Innovation in Cinema. In short, Dave's career speaks to the need for students to be well-versed in their disciplines but to be able to apply that knowledge to problems, and at the same time, understand the interrelationships among disciplines in the context of environmental and societal demands for the new society. The College of Education and Integrative Studies is pleased to have each one of these individuals representing us, demonstrating the values that we hold and the values that we hope to share with you, our graduates, as you go out into our society and carry on the mission of our college. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our speaker, Mr. Dave Master. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Navarro, um, Dr. Suzuki, uh, Dr. Ullenberger, and Dr. Berman and especially Dr. Sheila McCoy, a lifelong educator. The most important job in the world. And we're gonna lose a very good person. Hopefully, she'll stay with us in a lot of ways, especially in spirit. I've never given a commencement speech. I've given a lot of speeches over the years. And it'd be quite ironic for my uh, teachers from elementary through high school to see me up here giving a commencement speech. For most of my life, I had problems with school. This may seem like a strange statement coming from a lifelong educator in a commencement speech, but please let me explain. I had problems with school, but I always loved learning. Those of us who feel that way are not entirely alone. In fact, we're in some pretty good company, Einstein, Picasso, T.S. Eliot, Thomas Edison, just to name a few. But in my school experience, I was fortunate enough to have a few good teachers to make that whole experience worthwhile. In fact, they made all the difference in the world. Those who know me as an adult may find it hard to believe that I was quiet, withdrawn, and introverted when I entered school. I had plenty I wanted to say. I was bursting with ideas, but I couldn't get them out. I was a stutterer. I had a speech impediment that caused me to be self-conscious, so self-conscious that I did, I did everything I could to avoid speaking in public. What made matters worse was I grew up in the 50s, a time when rote learning not only reigned supreme, it wasn't even questioned. This was the back to time that they referred to in Back to Basics. And back then, learning to read was a public event. Every student was obligated to read aloud every day in class. Not only did the abstract marks on the page make no sense to me, which is how all of us start out anyway, but the emotional embarrassment associated with re the reading process made me dread every single day I spent in school. For me, reading was associated with deep emotional pain. As we all know, learning is a deeply personal experience. It is tied to our very identity and self-worth as human beings. As Arthur Costa writes, in order for the brain to comprehend, the heart must first listen. My heart was aching, and my brain wasn't listening. That first year progressed, but I didn't. By the end of the year, I couldn't read. After a year of personal embarrassment, I was about to receive the ultimate humiliation for a young child, 
I was about to be left back. I don't know what caused the next series of events to happen, but whatever the impetus, Mrs. Lake, my first grade teacher, began coming to school early, a couple of mornings a week, all through her summer vacation, just to teach me how to read. I remember Mrs. Lake being very patient and understanding, and she asked me what I was interested in. Well, at the time, I was crazy about dinosaurs. She began using dinosaur books to teach me to read. Well, anyone who has tried to pronounce, spell, or read complicated names of dinosaurs, Tyrannosaurus rex, Stegosaurus, Triceratops, knows how daunting a task it is for an adult, let alone a six-year-old child. But lo and behold, the markings on the page began to slowly make sense. And it didn't matter if there were more syllables in one dinosaur name than in the entire sentences I had previously had trouble with. I began to master these words like a budding paleontologist. I began to read. What happened? Was it a miracle? No. Mrs. Lake simply connected the words on the page to something I was interested in. She made it personally meaningful and purposeful for me. Mrs. Lake connected my heart to my head. She gave me a gift I've enjoyed every day of my life since that eventful summer. My next few years in school were a complete blur. The Russians sent Sputnik skyward, and the politicians were sent orbiting in a frenzied reaction. As usual, the schools would be used as an instrument of social change. Every student was to be tested and divided into groupings based on their supposed aptitudes and ability levels. I had an un the unfortunate luck of scoring well on these tests. Some faceless bureaucrats decided to sort us out like so many potatoes, and as a result, I was put in accelerated classes. I soon found out what the word accelerated meant. It was like being shot out of a cannon, a complete blur every single day. It was rote learning in overdrive. For most of my classmates and I, school was a series of confusing, disconnected activities that alternated between just plain dull and completely boring. Our teachers prevented us from interacting we did individual seat work at bolted down desks. And if that wasn't enough, they piled on the homework in some strange effort to make childhood impossible. I guess this system worked for some students, and some of my classmates did polish their apples and dutifully raise their hands, and they wielded their number two pencils in a display of Scantron wizardry. They piled up the gold stars, the happy face stamp hadn't been invented yet. And the rest of us kids just acted out or withdrew. We stopped trying. We shut down. It wasn't an organized social effort. That would come later when we all grew up and entered the 60s. We were just individual kids falling by the wayside. After three years of completely frustrating my teachers and my counselors, I was given a reprieve. I was put in Mr. Lanza's regular fifth grade class. Being a regular kid was some kind of put down in those days. Our new teacher, Mr. Lanza, seemed different right off the bat. Mr. Lanza smiled. His room wasn't barren and lifeless. His walls were covered with pictures, strange and mysterious charts, maps of far off places, timelines and quotations from people we never heard of. His classroom had big tables that groups of us could sit around. There was a big counter in front of his room with a big deep sink and a gas burner. I had never seen a classroom like this. And Mr. Lanza never sat at his desk. We wouldn't have been able to see him if he had. His desk was always piled high with books and paper and all boxes with all manner of things inside. Mr. Lanza was always walking around among us. When any of us would say something, he'd walk towards us, supporting and encouraging us. 
I stuttered in his class, but it didn't seem to bother anyone. And anyway, gone was the pressure. I usually spoke when I wanted to or when I had something to say. Mr. Lanza opened up our minds to geography, geology, biology, literature, math, and history and art. Everything in his class was an adventure, a project, an exploration. The vocabulary sheets were gone. We didn't do the odd-numbered questions on Mondays and the even-numbered ones on Tuesdays. In Mr. Lanza's class, learning was what Learning was about what we learned and not a, what about teachers managed to cover. The answers to all of our questions didn't fit in the back of a textbook. A few months into the year, Mr. Lanza somehow obtained blueprints for the Throgs Neck Bridge, a bridge that was under construction not far off in a neighborhood where I lived in Queens. Mr. Lanza announced to the class one day that we were going to build that bridge right there in class. We were going to finish it before the real one went up. We didn't know exactly what he meant, but it sure sounded important and grown up to us. Over the next few months, Mr. Lanza organized us into teams. We were all measuring and computing and scaling and modeling and building and cutting and drawing. We read books about bridges. We wrote about bridges. We drew pictures of bridges. We studied plans and diagrams of bridges. This single exciting activity opened up all kinds of worlds to us. It connected us to things we were interested in and things we didn't think we liked at all. We were making all sorts of new, exciting meanings for ourselves. And Mr. Lanza would let us figure out things for ourselves on our own. He'd make us struggle through problems, encouraging us, yet withholding the answers. He'd be there if we were frustrated, but just enough to help us figure it out for ourselves. Mr. Lanza never seemed to get mad if we messed things up. In fact, he'd just laugh and he'd say, well, I guess we better, better figure something else out to solve that problem. There were no demerits in his class. He'd always tell us, mistakes are the staircase to success. We had no reason to doubt him. It seemed we were climbing mountains every single day in his class. And when the dismissal bell rang at the end of the day, we'd all ask if we could stay after school, continue to work on our projects. The rest of the school looked as if the Bastille had just been liberated. Mr. Lanza's popularity must have created some professional jealousies. He didn't seem to fit in with the other teachers in school. Not only did he do things differently, but we used to hear the other teachers scold him from the noise coming out of his room, and heaven forbid, laughter too. Mr. Lanza must have paid dearly in faculty meetings for his transgressions on behalf of our learning. Eating with us and not eating with the faculty may have been his way of avoiding recriminations and retributions. He must have been a strong person to stand up to the social pressure to conform. Well, at the end of the year, Mr. Lanza entered our bridge in the Queens County Science Fair, and we won first prize. We were so excited and proud. We were the regular kids from the regular class, and we were on top of the world. Well, at least on top of fifth graders in Queens. And guess what? I stopped stuttering. Somewhere along the year, line that year, I stopped stuttering. I look back on it now, and it, it must have disappeared amid all of the activity and my loss of self-consciousness. Mr. Lanza connected our hearts to our heads with our hands. And in the process, he untied my tongue, which my wife and all of my friends sometimes wish he hadn't. And at the end of the year, I graduated. But unfortunately, that meant I had to leave Mr. Lanza's class. The next five years were a monotonous series of boring lectures interrupted only by pointless tests. In fact, I can't remember a single one of my junior high teachers' names. Their faces are as hazy as the dusty chalkboards they used. But I was reading a lot on my own, and I wasn't studying. And the hours of tedious seat work gave me hours to scribble and draw in my notebooks. 
I even created many animated films in the margins of my textbooks. I pursued this newfound avocation with zest. My peers loved my cartoons. They'd ask me to draw on their notebooks, paint logos on their football helmets. Drawing became my claim to fame with my peers. It made me feel accepted. My scribblings eventually landed me in Mr. Tom's art class. Mr. Tom was the head of the art department. He was well-read, world-traveled, and a practicing galleried artist. To Mr. Tom, art was a serious subject. Mr. Tom didn't care if the others thought it was a frill. As far as he was concerned, people of their ilk were Philistines, and their opinions mattered little to him. I don't know what Mr. Tom must have thought when he saw my caricatures and scribblings. I look back and shudder to think, but he met me where I was at the time, and he st struck an unwritten deal with me. He wouldn't judge me, but he'd draw me no slack when it, became, when it came to the application of artistic principles in my work. Mr. Tom built on my interest in drawing. He drew me into a wonderful world of design elements, compositional principles, and color theory. He taught me that these tools could be used to construct anything I wanted to design, draw, sculpt, paint, or create. Mr. Tom was kind, yet a very principled man. We corresponded from my high school graduation up until three months ago when he died at the age of 94. Mr. Tom had an enduring effect on my life. He was a great teacher. In fact, I'm not sure if I was really down deep inside even meant to be an artist, but his class was the only class that was interesting to me in high school, and he was the only high school teacher that supported me. I learned the principles as best I could, and I went off to college to avoid the draft. I was a visual arts major. We all minored in student unrest back in the 60s. Unfortunately, my arts professors were more concerned with their work than about preparing us for a tough competitive commercial art world. We did arts projects, but we never really had our work scrutinized by professionals in the field. The projects we did covered all of the art elements, but we learned little of professional standards. We put a lot of time into our college projects, but they were disconnected from the ongoing and rapid changes taking place in the professional field. We'd have professionals occasionally visit and speak, but there was no ongoing pre professional scrutiny. Not receiving professional feedback while we were in school was to haunt us upon graduation. We received our degrees, but our portfolios were not at the level of seasoned, experienced artists that we would later compete with. Unfortunately, after graduation, most of us had to redo our portfolios to meet those standards before we could land work. In the mid-70s, I moved to California and I returned to school to pick up my teaching credential. Unfortunately, I don't remember my teacher ed professors' names, nor do I remember much from their classes. They seemed more concerned with licensing than they did with learning. But fortunately, they did assign some great reading selections, which I devoured with great gusto. Alfred North Whitehead spoke of the romance of learning. And I immediately envisioned my first grade teacher, Mrs. Lake, breathing life into the pages of the books before me. I, re I read John Dewey and Mr. Lanza appeared. Priola Ferreira seemed to be writing about the students I was interning with in school. We seemingly had this great opportunity to connect where we was, what we were studying every day and to the classrooms we were teaching in Yet our assignments were more concerned with the style of Scrunk and White rather than the substance of Dewey and Whitehead. Upon credentialing, I went to teach in the nearby Roland Unified School District. I poured my heart and soul into my teaching. I taught visual art and animation for almost two decades. Like most arts teachers, I had a catch-as-catch-can budget and received little respect because art even though it's the second biggest export in the United States right now, is still considered a frill. My class became a so-called dumping ground for so-called troubled kids. 
but I loved those students. They and I had a lot in common. I found my students loved learning, and in fact, they worked tirelessly on their projects. We made an average of 100 films a year, and in fact, these students won first place in almost every single festival they ever entered, including first place internationally 17 years in a row. A few years into my teaching career, I was to meet my last great teacher. His name was Bill Scott. He had no credential. He had no university degree that I know of. He was the writer, director, and the voice of the Bullwinkle cartoons. Bill had seen some of my students' films at a festival. He was especially taken in by my students' enthusiasm as he assaulted the stage to receive their awards. Soon after, he, re he visited my classroom. I asked him what he thought of my students' work, and he asked a fateful question. Do any of these students have aspirations of becoming professional animators? I paused for a moment and then answered in the affirmative. Bill then gave me a grandfatherly look, a look I'd soon experienced quite frequently. His brow furrowed, and he told me that I'd have to get more serious with the students I was teaching. Just as my college instructors had, I was teaching the disciplinary principles, but just as they hadn't, I wasn't connecting them to the real world professional applications. Well, for the next eight years, Bill Scott and other professionals visited my class and critiqued my students' work, and they held the students to professional standards. Over the next decade, my students met every challenge the professionals threw at them. It wasn't easy for them, lots of serious work and many late nights and very long weekends. My peers would ask me why I'd put in so much time with my students, and I'd think to myself, Mrs. Lake, spent an entire summer with me, one student. When administrators grumbled that my classroom was too untraditional, I think of the pressure Mr. Lanza must have suffered. When they'd make comments about the so-called troublemakers in my classes, I'd remember how Mr. Tom befriended me. When people would call my class a frill, I think of the hundreds of students that graduated from my program to become professional animators, storyboard artists, and designers. I am very fortunate to be in contact with most of my former students. In fact, on my last film at Warner Brothers, I worked with 40 of my former students. My former students have always thanked me for their success, but in truth, these students were touched by this genealogy of teaching. The teachers that cared to nurture my learning, Mrs. Lake, Mr. Lanza, Mr. Tom, and Bill Scott. These great teachers taught me how to connect my students' hearts, their heads, their hands, to their futures. I was very lucky to have a few teachers to make a difference in my life. They didn't let the outside world crush their enthusiasm. They didn't let the infighting in the faculty lounge drain their energy. My entire life, is indebted to them. Every teacher count, touches countless lives. A great teacher can illuminate even the darkest schoolroom. Teaching is the most important job in the world. We are responsible for nurturing the future. I'll end with a quote from Ted Sizer. Soft, mindless schools will not prepare our young citizens for the harsh and intellectually demanding world that confronts them. We must remember that we are dealing with the most precious treasures that humans have, the hearts and the minds of their children. As you commence in your futures into this wonderful and great profession, I'd like to leave you with just these last words. Be tender with your students' hearts. Be principled when you engage their minds. And be determined to make a difference in their lives. Thank you, and good luck. And I love every teacher out there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dave. And now I'd like to call on Dr. Jane Allenberger to present the master candidates. 
Will the, all the candidates for the Masters of Arts in Education please rise? <laughs> President Suzuki, I present the 57 candidates for the Master's Degree from the College of Education and Integrated Studies. The candidates have completed the requirements for the master's degree as prescribed by the State of California and the trustees of the California State University, and they have been recommended by the faculty of California State Polytechnic University, Pomona. Candidates for the master's degree, you have heard the recommendation of the faculty of California State Polytechnic University, Pomona. By the authority vested in me as president, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Education with all the rights, honors, and opportunities appertaining thereto. Congratulations. Will the marshal for the college please escort the candidates for the Master of Arts degree in Education to the stage for hooding? And upon receiving your diploma cover, President Suzuki will congratulate you. Denise Marie Dunn. Donna Lynn Cotter. Robin Gwendolyn Boos. Maria Susana Cueva. <laughs> Lou Ray Partlow. Constance R. Kepner. Deanna Karen Iverson. Josephine Williams. Grace Mendoza Lim Hayes. Faith E. Fultz. Patricia Grill Verlingeri. <laughs> Pamela Sue Charters. <laughs> Beth Parkinson Ruiz. Alfred John Cruz II. Daniel L. Contreras.
Fred Myers. Edward Steve Gonzalez. Farah Fatime Misbani. Vanessa Ray Smith. Ngazi Chinwe Metu. Genevieve Marie DeCenso. Brandy Renee Plummer. Michelle Edson. Lena M. Bennett. Grace K. Lee. Kara Bivana Gugino. Patrick Carl Gugino. Robin Lee Artin. Shifra Curtis. Rebecca Lou Sarah Bean. Heather D. Giles. Todd William Hancock. Brent H. M. Keller. Congratulations to our master's degree holders. And now, will the candidates for the baccalaureate degree please rise. <laughs> President Suzuki, it gives me great pleasure present to you the candidates for the Bachelor of Arts in Gender, Ethnicity, and Multicultural Studies and the Bachelor of Arts in Liberal Studies. These very shy and quiet 252 candidates have completed the requirements for their degree as prescribed by the State of California and the trustees of the California State University. They have been recommended by the faculty of the California State Polytechnic University at Pomona.
Candidates for the baccalaureate degree, you have heard the recommendation of the faculty of California State Polytechnic University, Pomona. By the authority vested in me as president, I confer the degree of Bachelor of Arts in Gender, Ethnicity, and Multicultural Studies and the Bachelor of Arts in Liberal Studies with all the rights, honors, and opportunities appertaining thereto. Congratulations. We haven't finished yet. In academic tradition, a student who has not yet earned a degree wears the mortarboard tassel on the right side. When the degree has been conferred, the scholar moves the tassel to the left and joins a select company. In recognition of your new status, will each recipient please move your tassel to the left? Congratulations. To the class of 2001, I commend you for your tremendous effort and accomplishments. For the marshals of the college, please escort the Gender, Ethnicity, and Multicultural Studies and Liberal Studies candidates for the Bachelor of Arts degree to the stage. Sonia Parada. Thelma Gonzalez. Maria Cruz Esparza. Karen Lynn Rodriguez. Marina Mora. Noel Alexandria Conley. Valia Margarita Martinez. Eric E. Ward. Angela Lee. Alice E. Herrera. Patricia Ann Tetzloff. Mariella Hart. Jeanette Rodriguez. Alfred Manuel Macias. Teresa A. Padilla. Mercedes Rodriguez. Elizabeth Soriano. Sylvia Enid Rivera. Maribel Caria Figueroa. Delia Ramsey. Sylvia Ramirez Sotelo. Regina Yip. Brandy Nicole Elliott. Rachel Elizabeth Tate. Robert A. Sanchez. Desiree Antoinette Moreno. Cynthia Mubarak. Robin Annette Bashford. Alexandria Marie Sweat. Jessica Ann Klingtong Yenjai. Eric Ortiz. Megan Lamb. Anna Marie Catalos. 
Amy Betty Chopra. Corey Lee Mejia. Monique Eileen Chambers. Jamie Limbaga. Julie Marie Rivas. Richard G. Quiroga. Xiao Yen Sun. Julie Lynn Bozek. John Bustamante. Christian Flores. Jason Michael Plahey. Heather Renee Hovenier. Andrea Marie Valdez. Jamie Christiana Smith. Jennifer Ashley Matsuno. Salvatrice Dominica DiVincenzo. Jennifer Diane Redmond. Aisha Linnell Smith. Dina Michelle Brown. Sister Inez Sandoval. Sister Anne Marie Valencia. Jeray Lynn Moore. April K. Wessel. Carolyn Lee Anderson. Danielle Luis Caro. Jill Marie Marshall. Sandra Robles. Marcia Macy. Victoria Lydia Bautista. Sarah Ann Peltier. Leticia Nancy Lopez. Heather Leanne Anderson Scott. Janice Marie Ramos Aitona. Christmas Lay. Tammy Tran Nguyen. Veronica Angela Ruiz. Sandra Villegas. Resma Kittrell. Sabrina Yvette Barrieri. Spring Hempsey. Sarah Dawn Harbert.
Renee Dark. Michelle Tina Castillo. Nadia Areola. Guadalupe Acosta. Mary Dorothy Hancock. Carol L. Gaines. Jaime Francisco Anabalan. Marianne A. Montillo. Cindy Esther Morales. Armando Rodriguez. Judith Aguilar. Alice T. Quinn. Susan Lorraine Jackson. Meredith Michelle Melton. Rebecca Rivas. Jamie Lynn Keene. Heather Michelle Kaufman. Tanya Pelinero. Anthony Michael De La Rosa. Randon Lee Geisler. Allison Janine Sanya. Andrea Spencer. Fernanda Cagle. Kimberly Ann Abel. Marina Cagle. Sandra Naimi Cano. Rosa Maricela Mendez. Cheryl Steinheimer. James Richard Maxwell III. Carrie Lorna Turner. Carolina Vargas. Maria Del Refugio Rodriguez. Norma Iris Rivera. Monica Ramos. Alita Carmen Gieselbach. Claudia Lopez Arevalo. Teresa Curiel Collins. Nancy Winetta Sifter. Sherry Lynn Richardson. Veronica Herrera. Michelle Gray. Cheryl R. Sumalong. Nora Jane Babinski. David Rodriguez. Chris Demersift. Christina Tiffany Farron. Tanya Noemi Marquez. 
Crystal Lynn Miller. Adrian Irene Gregorick. Megan Lynn Church. April Marie Willenborg. Cheyenne Dawn Kruger. Kelly Christine Fisher. Misty Pauline Rice. Catherine Marie Whiz. Jennifer Ellen Heron. Vanyi T. Tran. Christine Marie Barker. Karen Alyssa Baker. Quinn Mackenzie Bebb. Marianne Cordes. Leslie Linnell McGurr. Kara Lee Dietz. Shannon Lee Walker Mason. Noemi Mimi Ciordia. Jennifer Mercado. Angela Therese Rondero. Marta Elena Rodriguez. Nancy Elizabeth Cole. Tracy Marie Campbell. Casey Michelle Alzugaray. Rochelle Christina Sosa. Sarah Tracy Marie Burrell. Susan Avila. Audrey Marie Dominguez. Melissa Manjares. Vanessa Ann Robles. Sean Min Tu. Mabel Madero. Carrie Ann Perez. Lisa Michelle Scott. Kimberly Linnell Kunkel. Lauren J. Sakari. Kerry Carla Bowling. David James White. June Kim. Leslie Abigail Carity. Nalita Perez. Dominic Richard Barrow. Kristen Ann Voorhees. Therese Sarah Ann Zasla. Sylvester Maravilla. Nathan Daniel Wesley. Amber Rochelle Johnson. 
Wendy Jacqueline Roberts. Bradley James Stewart. Karen Audrey Vetter. John Paul Rangan Recinto. Deborah Poon. Kimberly S. Naka. Shella Chen. Congratulations, class of 2001. Save the confetti, we still have our credential candidates. And I'm very pleased to welcome our credential candidates for 2001. I congratulate you on your endeavors and accomplishments in attaining your teaching credential. Will the recommended credential candidates please rise? And will the marshals of the college please escort the credential candidates to the stage where they will receive their certificates of congratulations? I was telling the credential candidates earlier that each one of them represents about 30 candidates because having our ceremonies on Friday afternoon makes it very difficult for many of them who were in the classroom, but we're very pleased to have them and we, and we know that next year there will be several more. Congratulations. Craig Allen Gillette. Princess Sita T. Parungao. Glenda Alex. Sharon J. Holland. Now, the whole class of 2001, congratulations. All right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, families and friends, join us, please, congratulating them. Wonderful, wonderful accomplishments. This is a very happy occasion. And you know, many people worked hard to help you to get here, to help you to reach the commencement day. Earlier, I recognized several members of our faculty, and now I'd like to re recognize the remaining. It's the faculty who passed the torch of enthusiasm for knowledge and the ability to perform as professionals in your discipline. And it's the staff who work together with the faculty who see to the ongoing support for learning and the many professionals who give their time and energy to make the college even stronger. So please, let us recognize them now. You know, earlier I spoke of hard work, self-discipline, and sacrifice. And I know that it's not just you graduates doing that alone, but it's together with the support and love of families, friends, spouses, children, siblings, 
all helping you to reach this point, this pinnacle of your life. Let us join our faculty and staff, our university administration, join in thanking you, the family members, for everything you have done to bring your graduates here today. Thank you very much. Even you back there in the shade, congratulations. <laughs> And now, before bringing these proceedings to a close, I'd like to once again offer my personal congratulations to our graduates, whose achievements we celebrate this afternoon. It's been my pleasure to preside over the commencement for the College of Education and Integrative Studies. I welcome you, the graduates, into the academic community. I also wish to welcome you as our newest alumni and invite you to join the Cal Poly Pomona Alumni Association to maintain your ties to the university. I would also like to give a special tribute to two faculty who will be retiring this year, Dr. Sheila McCoy and Dr. Constance Lim, and we wish you well, congratulations. And now, will the audience please remain seated during the recessional. At the conclusion of the faculty recessional, our commencement in the year 2001 will be formally concluded. And thank you all very much for being here with us this afternoon. Thank you.